Okay, I thought we'll start now. Uh, good evening, uh, namaste, and welcome to this the fourth episode of uh, this season of our conversation series. Uh, these, uh, this conversation series is organized by the Vivekananda Institute for Leadership Development, we lead, which is a unit of the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement. These uh, conversations hope to bring speakers and people from a wide range of backgrounds and spanning topics of development, social issues, leadership, and education, culture, heritage, and much more. And uh, what we've also seen is that you know, these uh, talks are organized, like I said, by the Vivekananda Institute for Leadership Development. Uh, VLEAD's mission is to develop human and social capital for nation building. And this it does by engaging across uh, three broad themes, which are uh, leadership, education, and development. And it's a pleasure today to have uh, as our guest, Surajit Dasgupta. Surajit Dasgupta is a multifaceted uh, personality, a polymath with interests and expertise spanning journalism, mathematics, physics, history, linguistics, and music. Uh, currently the editor-in-chief of Surf News, Surajit has worked as desk head, My Nation, executive editor, Hindustan Samachar, national affairs editor, Swarajya, as special correspondent, Money Life, senior editor, The Pioneer, and a science correspondent with the statesman. He has taught mathematics and science, besides dabbling in sales and marketing as well. A pleasure and privilege to have you as our guest, uh, Surajit Dasgupta. Thank you, Rameshji. Yeah, and uh, this particular conversation, we uh, looks at the state of media today and the issues that confront it. It will also try to examine the question of whether the media still has a role in nation building. And if the media, does the media reflect societal and cultural values or has it started to shape it? Does the media inform us or influence us? These and many more questions shall be explored in this uh, conversation. And uh, like I said, uh, you know, I would like to start straight away with uh, that particular question itself. There was a time when the media was called the fourth uh, pillar of democracy with the mandate to keep the public informed and the executive on its toes. And, and uh, I don't think anybody is arguing with the, the fact that the media has not played a stellar role or in shaping democracy or doing anything of those or giving voice to the voiceless or any of those things. But uh, it seems like this pillar is not only cracking, but in fact, uh, you know, starting to crumble. So I just was, you know, straight away starting with that. How did we come to this? And what do you think are the uh, causes that uh, is perhaps leading to this. I'd start with this uh, question. Thank you, Ramesh ji. Uh, I have been keenly watching your programs. Your uh, institute is doing a wonderful job bringing in people from different walks of life who have a constructive role to play in society and nation building. I uh, particularly like the session you had with IPS officer Hemant Pandeji. Uh, that was that had a very rare personal touch to it, uh, which I did not expect from a high ranking police officer. It was uh, very refreshing and also quite enlightening. Uh, to answer your question, let me begin typically as an Indian, since we are a civilizational people. A lot of us consider Narada Devarshi Narada as the first journalist. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was the person who would take information from one part, from one God to another, or from God to humans and vice versa. And you would see that while he never lied, he would often play tricks with the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't call it mischief, but it has been happening from time immemorial. And then, of course, uh, as far as, uh, you know, the documented history that we are taught, there we had things like smoke signals in prehistoric times, when one group of people had to inform another group of people who were at some distance. They used to light a fire so that the smoke would reach there. 
and uh, different kinds of smoke. In fact, we do not have all the details. Uh, historians could not excavate or extricate all the details, but that was again, a very primitive form of journalism, informing people basically. Then if you come to the time around the industrial revolution, you would find what you see today in India as journalism uh, that had germinated in Europe, as well as in the US, which was also struggling at that point, uh, both before and after the American Revolution. So there, Europe and America took two very distinct routes to journalism, of which there is one branch that Indians seem to be more fascinated with, which is the European branch. For a very long time, I'm not talking about these days, where a lot of these uh, newspapers and news websites have turned into propaganda machines. But there was a time when there was a very distinct difference between the BBC line and the New York Times line. Uh, uh, the Time magazine had always been very hostile towards India, but the New York Times was not, the Washington Post was not. And especially when we were, uh, you know, uh, when I learned French, then in the last two semesters, we were doing comparative media studies. And there, I also found that uh, to be a part of the university syllabus in France, uh, University of Sorbonne had it. Uh, for one. And uh, even the French would say that somehow uh, the newspaper that they had, the most popular newspaper as far as political news is concerned, was Le Monde in France. And, uh, but even there, uh, of, if all the publications were considered, then the most popular one is L'Equip, which is a sports uh, newspaper. So when journalists and news consumers in France started mulling over what went wrong, that people have started losing faith, losing interest in political news. They uh, stumbled upon quite a few flaws in the European way of doing journalism, which you see in India nowadays also. There is too much of opinionating. It is to presume that the reader or the viewer is dumb or is intellectually challenged that he has to be told what is happening, not just what is happening, but how he should be looking at what is happening. Which is what you see uh, nowadays uh, in television channels, somebody doing it for the left wing, mostly most uh, channels are doing it for the left wing, most newspapers are doing it with, for the left wing, and a few startups are struggling to do it for the right wing. That is how I see the scenario now. Uh, of course, there had been another problem in the Europe, which uh, India does not suffer from. There was uh, an era, quite a long period, of free newspapers that devastated the business of uh, other uh, you know, newspapers that you had to buy and read. So uh, it, it was like the yellow pages available for free. Uh, some certain yellow pages are available for free. And uh, for example, free ads, there is a newspaper called free ads. Right. So, uh, yeah. So then uh, when imagine such a newspaper turning to mainstream news also, uh, if the authority allows it, then of course the Times of India, the Hindu, the Indian Express, etc., will stop selling. If people get all the news, uh, because newspaper for one is no longer as cheap as it used to be at one point in the 1990s at the height of competition between them. I remember both Times of India and Hindustan Times would come for just one rupee per copy right. at one point in 1990. Now uh, newspapers cost five rupees or six rupees a copy. And uh, uh, for a lot many people, especially the lower middle class, that uh, makes a substantial amount if you consider the monthly bill. Uh, because then, of course, you also take some magazines, some journals, et cetera, and then uh, the cost rises substantially, which would not pinch you if you are a voracious and very avid reader of news. 
If not, if you are in, uh, instead of free newspapers, we have got free websites now. Right. It feels like free. You are spending data to read it on your mobile phone or your laptop, right. but then you, it does not pinch you then and there. So you tend to feel that you are getting news for free. Right. And uh, but here yeah. again, I am saying. Uh, I hope I'm not stretching it too long. Uh, I, I just have had two follow-ups on uh, two of the things that you pointed to. Um, yes. Your point about, uh, you know, uh, increasingly newspapers look, uh, or uh, media for that matter, uh, looking to shape opinion, if, if I understood you right, rather right. than allowing, uh, you know, readers or viewers to make their own uh, uh, interpretations of what is being presented to them. Yes. But, uh, you know, uh, I have been a consumer of uh, news for quite some time. So I, I, I've, I've seen, uh, you know, uh, opinions uh, being published even in those days when, you know, uh, in, in those days of the old newspapers or uh, whereas I, I know that Doordarshan had only news and not views. And so they did not have views that they tried to present to the, so, but they had only news. But uh, wasn't it uh, always the case, or are you saying that you know this is that there is it's now skewed more towards opinion and less towards uh, uh, news? It was never as brazen as it is now. Right. It was always a bit uh, opinionated. If it had not been so, why would uh, the British Empire put so many journalists in jail? Right. Certainly, there was some opinion in there, which. Uh, you know, several journalists who did not want to bend and uh, abide by the rules set by the British Empire, they revolted. Many even went to the extent of uh, making handwritten newspapers and they would deliver it by hand in their locality. Because, uh, you know, without transportation, you cannot make the paper reach far and wide. And even then, the uh, police under the British rule uh, hounded them out and uh, put them in jail. And uh, But then, if we consider the post-independence era, then I remember the first newspaper that I worked with, the Statesman, was headed by one Mr. C.R. Iradi. Uh, every journalist has heard of his name. He was uh, a staunch and trenchant critic of Indira Gandhi. And uh, people in Calcutta and uh, across East India who subscribed to Statesman looked forward to, uh, you know, how strong a critique of Indira Gandhi's policies would be published in the next day's uh, Statesman. And he was such zealous in his work that normally a chief editor does not write uh, every day. Uh, the, you know, duties are delegated among junior journalists. But uh, C.R. Irani used to get so excited about these things that he would personally occupy the anchor. You know, uh, I'll use a few uh, technical terms in course of this conversation. An anchor is uh, the lowermost portion of a newspaper uh, on the front page. Right, right. Okay. Uh, yeah, the top, the top portion, the top band that you see on a newspaper just below the masthead, which is the logo, is called the flyer. And the one that appears at the bottom, where these are certain positions of the newspaper where, uh, you know, your, which catch the eyesight, first of all, which catch uh, your attention, first of all. They're very prominent uh, positions inside a newspaper. The front page flyer is the most prominent of all. And then you turn the page like this, you look at the bottom of the newspaper. That is page one anchor. The other very uh, prominent part of a newspaper is when you turn it around the flip side, the last page, which used to be once occupied by sports. Right. But nowadays it's miscellaneous. So CR Irani used to occupy the front page bottom part, which is the front page anchor. He would be so excited about cursing Indira Gandhi for whatever she was doing. So that, that was then, that is 80s and 90s. Now, of course, he lived uh, a certain part of this millennium also, but uh, he, he was quite aged by then and not, uh, you know, certainly past his prime. 
but then we also had a very influential and clearly leftist line taken by the ndtv which was a production house then mm -hmm. and not an independent channel right they used it, to make that uh, the world this week or something like that that used to yes Durdarsh. it began with the world this week and it, there was uh, allegation of corruption even there because what they did was they used some footage of Doordarshan and sent them to the Doordarshan office saying, this is our footage, you must pay for it. So the tech, uh, you know, this, yeah. yeah. So the state exchequer paid unduly for uh, this fraudulence by NDTV. Anyway, the main issue here is nearly for the entire stretch of cable television before DTH arrived, uh, the whole of 1990s was dominated by NDTV as a production house. Uh, there was no Times Now, there was no Republic, there was no uh, CNN, IBN, which went on to become Network 18. All these things were absent. So uh, NDTV was making uh, initially, uh, uh, you know, uh, videos and all for uh, Star News, which is now. Yeah. ABP News uh, and Star News, I think, was owned by Rupert Murdoch. So that was a 24-7 propaganda machine, NDTV. And just so that you do not get put off, they would also very cleverly put in a bit of patriotic stuff, for example, the coverage of uh, Kargil War. But even there, there was a scandal. Because there, Barkhadat was uh, accused of disclosing uh, the strategic positions of Indian Army troops. Uh, and nevertheless, whatever the allegations are, there was no competition. So the uh, viewers had no choice. You could not switch to another channel because there was no other private okay. channel available. And uh, everything said and done, no matter how serious Doordarshan is, uh, let me put it very bluntly, Doordarshan is also utterly boring. It is. It cannot keep you glued onto your seats. It is such a boring presentation technique. And I have also worked with DD News for two years as a news reader. And in fact, uh, I would say that at the end of it, when my training ended and I had to start working for Doordarshan, I started feeling that I could do everything except reading news. Uh, okay. They, they, you know, imposed so many rules on us, all of us who were selected and shortlisted. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. You cannot gulp. You know, if, if you, you cannot clear your throat, uh, you, you cannot even make a, a fly, fly away if it sits on your face. Uh, so, so many, uh, you know, ridiculously stringent rules they would impose on you that finally you would remember all of them and forget how to read the news. Right. So, so which, which is why, you know, when you look at the Doordarshan screen, it seems sometimes that the person sitting out there is a robot. No facial expression, nothing, just a stoic I, I, face. I, yeah, I, just, I, I thought that was, uh, uh, you know, you know uh, something that was praised in, the, in those days. You know, it's like this person is the expressionless delivery of uh, uh, news <laughs> used to be... Uh, since, you, since you brought up all of these uh, things, mm. I just wanted to you know step back a little and go back to the first question where we said uh, where we looked at uh, you know uh, development itself, and I and I use the term in a the, in a in a, in a qu quite a large sense in the sense that shaping uh, narratives or uh, yes, you know, I was coming to that. Yes. Also helping yes. the uh, helping the nation in a way uh, mm. or taking a stand that is uh, positively nationalistic or at least, at least during specific times and all of that. Uh, right. Do you think that the media still has some relevance in that role or do you see media, because I when, when we see it as lay people, we primarily seem to be seeing it more as infotainment uh, for lack of a better word rather than, uh, you know, uh, news that, that helps you, if not make up your mind, at least, you know, helps you get get to understand what's happening i don't you know i, I refuse to see this because the same news is seems very different across uh, you know multiple platforms that you just now mentioned so yeah. th does yeah. does the media at least have any role at all in shaping narratives uh, at, at all or shaping development 
as a it, factor at all. It should have, and I hope it does. You know, hope sometimes is a negative word because when you hope, it means it does not exist. Right. So it, it almost means that if you're hoping something happens, that means it has not happened yet. So, but no, uh, there was a time, there have been different periods in contemporary history where uh, the media has played a role, a significant role in nation building, because every time you uh, do not get to watch the proceedings of the parliament to know what your representatives are uh, speaking or arguing about amongst themselves. Uh, before 1990s, uh, there was no live telecast of uh, the parliamentary proceedings either. But then, just as I said uh, in the answer to your previous question about uh, viewers' lack of choice, uh, viewers, or I would say there was a citizen's lack of choice of ideology till the end of 1980s. Because even the media just towed the line of Jawaharlal Nehru and Indira Gandhi and then Rajiv Gandhi. And it seemed, uh, you know, after a brief euphoria in the mid 1970s when the JP movement was coming up, once the Murarji Desai government was formed for those three years from, because, uh, you know, I am telling uh, this from memory. And uh, fortunately for me, uh, I had been, uh, you know, uh, introduced to this world of news at a very uh, young age. Uh, I started with, of course, uh, you know, cartoon strips, comic strips in the uh, newspapers when I was just five or six years old. When I was about eight or ten, I began reading sports news. Right. And then... Uh, finally, I moved on to politics when I was, I think, in, in the grade 8th, 9th, 10th, etc. That was when I moved yeah, to... Yeah, I think that's typically how the uh, kids of the uh, you know, late 70s or 80s, uh, you know, right. started to read. I think I can relate to that because that's how... So, because it I means, yeah, very reading. clearly remember that in the 1978, 79 and 80, it almost seemed that the media was desperate to get Indira Gandhi back. Mm -hmm. You know, almost everything that Murarji Desai and later on Charan Singh was doing, it seemed it was wrong for them. You know, every change that they were trying to bring about from the way the country had been run for so many decades before them seemed to be wrong in the eyes of, uh, you know, chief editors especially. Uh, at, in, in that era, the owners of media houses were still not as strong as they are today. So the owners finally, uh, you know, lay on the chief editors. So most of the chief editors, especially in 1979, uh, sounded like they were desperate to get Indira Gandhi back. And then, of course, uh, she came back, which means that in that era of newspaper dominance, where even Doordarshan news was uh, hardly, uh, you know, as uh, I would say, as advanced as what it became under Rajiv Gandhi later on. Mm. Uh, it was, of course, another, uh, it still remained very much a mouthpiece of the ruling party under Rajiv Gandhi. But even coverage was not there during Indira Gandhi's time. So, of course, the newspapers dominated that scene. So certainly I would say that the outcome of the 1980 election when Indira Gandhi came back, uh, uh, you know, a lot of that can be attributed to the media commentary uh, throughout the years of uh, 17, uh, you know, 1979 and the part of 1980 before the election. Then let me come to a negative aspect of uh, over propaganda, if there is such a word which you saw in 1989 when Rajiv Gandhi lost. You know, uh, it, it had become such a, uh, what can I call, trumpet of Rajiv Gandhi that people used to get put off after a while, you know, watching the TV. So then, of course, uh, they stopped believing in what was being said on television. And once again, the newspapers dominated. Uh, cable TV was still quite a few years into the future. It had uh, not yet arrived in the 80s. 
And then the most remarkable and positive part that the media played was during the rule of Narasimha Rao. Narasimha, before Narasimha Rao, as I was saying, that there was no choice of ideology even. And, uh, you know, even for science students like me, who did not study social studies, history, and geography beyond class 10, mm. were tutored through the books in the final two years that Nehru and Indira Gandhi's socialism was the best possible policy, no debates entertained. So it was the uh, you know, senior editors, journalists, columnists, etc., who uh, made us look at the economy differently by constantly harping that the uh, road on which India has walked so far, as far as the economy is concerned, was wrong. Mm. And these are the virtues of the private sector. This is why business cannot be done by a government entity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that, of course, I would credit the media with. Uh, that was nation building. And today, uh, the minuscule section of the population who comment on political and economic affairs, who say uh, that, no, uh, you know, government has no business doing business. That is the generation that got its education. <clears throat> I beg your pardon. Education uh, in economics from newspapers, from columns of magazines. And all of them, of course, there is a negative uh, aspect to it which is that why should you speak that language only when the government wants you to speak that language? What happened to that ideology, that same times of India, the same India today, who, who would push uh, pro-market capitalism between 1991 and 96? Why did they sing a different tune under 10 years of UPA rule? And even now, even now you would see that on the one hand, if you read the editorials, editorials uh, and editorial is the official stand of a newspaper on a given issue. It is not an individual editor or senior editor's view. So even today, if you read the editorials of Indian Express, whenever it is on economic affairs, you would see them pushing for market reforms, pushing for pro-market things. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it is so ironic that they keep promoting such groups and parties that are socialist in nature. Now, if you want pro-market capitalism in your country, why are you encouraging, why are you celebrating Maoists, for example? Why are you, wherever there is a, a, a rabble rouser, a new kid on the block who makes a lot of noise, so you, you start you celebrating that person on the front page, it means you are creating an atmosphere which is very hostile to business. Now, so if, if you want business, yeah. yeah yes. sorry, if I were to play the devil's advocate here, yes, and and uh, uh, pose to you the question that you know, uh, they they are uh, uh, they are doing what is what is called in the advertising sector fair balance. You know, they are, you know balancing while they give a, while they are taking a stand, they are also allowing people with the different views. To be a, a platform where they can where they can also share their views. I mean, is is, is that something? Is, is that what is happening, or is it more more to do with? Uh... Well, uh, when I was a junior journalist, I would always say that if I were to run an ideal newspaper, mm. uh, it would give equal space because I, being a print journalist, I always thought in terms of newspaper, not in terms of news channels. So I would always say that, well, my front page will look half left and half right. You know, there, there would be a portion uh, that says, uh, you know, left has done this. There is another portion that would say right has done this. One part to CPM, one part to BJP. Mm -hmm. that, that's all right. That's a, but nobody is doing that. What they are doing yeah. is they are promoting certain nefarious elements. There is one uh, thing to say that Stan Swami has died. Mm. It is an entirely different thing to start crying for Stan Swami. Right. Or to, so that, uh, that, is, that is the difference. You know, that is the difference I'm trying to, uh, you know, put across to the viewers. Yeah. That it is perfectly fine that saying, all right, on this and this day, Narendra Modi, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said this, CPM General Secretary Sitaram Yechuri said this, 
UPA chairperson Sonia Gandhi said, this, this is neutral journalism. I have no problem with that. Right, right. When you start celebrating one of them, that is when you cannot yes. call it neutrality. But uh, if, if you look at uh, the uh, publications that are, that are current, that are available in the market today, uh, at least for, for, to me, you know, it, it looks like most of them have become even more polarized in how they are shaping. Because there are, there are, even if we were to say, you know, you spoke about the struggling uh, newspaper, uh, you know, newspapers and media houses that are that push the agenda or mm. push the views of the right uh, in the Indian right. I mean, there is, I mean, I don't even know if right is the right word to describe yeah. this situation. But even there, uh, even here, I mean, if we were to take a take a deep look at what is happening, we find that it's completely polarized. It's it's just one set of stories that appear here and only one set of stories that appear there there is not there is not enough space or in fact zero space for people with differing views to be able to uh, publish an article either on that side or this side so uh, like like a question that's come up in the chat uh, like professor giridhar says why why is it that only negativity sells so uh, so is it, yeah. is it more to do with the the commercial aspect that you know it's it's that it's better to polarize and talk only about that and therefore that will sell rather than look at positive things and i would say it is a misfortune or i would say it is also a human attribute to look for things that are either frivolous or they are negative okay. uh, and uh, in fact when uh, you consider a journalist as a normal citizen, just like anybody else. And he, of course, will have certain political preferences also. But uh, despite that, uh, you know, uh, there is a kind of veiled position, political position that the person takes in his or her columns, or if he or she is the chief editor, then the entire newspaper. Now, in, in that, you would see that uh, there are certain aspects that come from basic training. For example, a very famous saying in journalism is, the cat sat on the mat is not news. The cat sat on the dog's mat is news. Which means, unless there is a sense of conflict, unless there is a sense of confrontation, it is not news. So we can't help it if by nature it is like that. If you keep saying it's a wonderful world, nobody is going to uh, read your uh, news website or your newspaper. Maybe once in a while, certain positive things also sell. For example, when there is a humanitarian touch to it, for instance, a uh, 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 citizen, uh, what is called, in the, if I may borrow from the Bible, Good Samaritan. Mm. You know, so uh, there are stories of Good Samaritans in newspapers which people like once in a while, that somebody went out of the way. And even, uh, you know, there can be stories of patriotic fervor. For example, I remember one of the most popular videos that I posted on Facebook was a few kids last year in May, a uh, few kids in uh, Northern Uttar Pradesh rushing to Nepal border and uh, the border security forces guys, they stop them saying, Bacche kaha ja rahe ho? Mm. and the kids say that we are going to fight China. China is an evil force and they have taken, uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, intruded into our territory and uh, they have taken away parts of our land. We cannot let this happen. So, you know, just that sheer innocence of the children that people liked. And it uh, did very well even uh, on our news website, that particular video. Uh, people were moved by their gesture, you know, by very little, you know, I, I think five or six year old, uh, not even uh, from well-to-do families, you know, they did not have shoes on. Uh, so, uh, and the clothes made it very clear they were from poor families. So that's, uh, again, something very positive. Then there could be something very negative where, uh, you know, uh, a story um, quite some months ago was that uh, a COVID patient, 
uh, had died, a woman, and uh, her son refused to cremate her because he had converted to Christianity. So uh, that 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 was again, and uh, you know that woman's daughter was out of her wits. She did not know what to do. That again was a story of human emotions uh, and also uh, politics of the ordinary citizens. Mm -hmm. This was not politics of BJP, Congress, CPM, etc. This is politics of religion. This is politics that affects us in our routine lives. So it was a very moving story and it did very well. But then there were also, if we take for example, uh, some, uh, you know, some instances from the Hindi language media. How did India TV of Rajat Sharma come up? Initially, they would say, uh, show things like, uh, you know, fight between a, a, a snake and a mongoose. Uh, or, or let's say, koi ek din mein pachas samosa kha gaya. That is India TV breaking news. Uh, but now look at India TV now. It's a serious channel. So I would say that they compromised on uh, their editorial line just to uh, carve a niche in the market. Once they achieved that, they became serious. So whether you consider it right or wrong, that is, of course, uh, your, that's your choice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now that we've uh, touched upon all of uh, these things, I think that it, uh, you spoke about Facebook. So, so I think it's also we need to look at. So do you think social media will at some stage, upstage, and perhaps even supplant uh, mainstream media? For one, you know, social media makes it possible for users to curate the content that they want to read and also you know the agencies that they also want to engage with so it has also meant that consumers of news can interact now real time with uh, news editors you know writers and all of that so in that sense uh, i mean with, without a doubt social media has uh, started to shape how uh, mainstream media is also starting to uh, you know talk about uh, news and other things but do you see at some stage because there is this narrative you know there are quite a few people and uh, who talk about how social media is the next big place and you know people international uh, people like uh, let, let's say dr peterson or joe rogan who have people who have 2 million 3 million viewers on their uh, podcasts and video casts it is they who will uh, shape the world and mainstream media over time would simply disappear do you see that happening or how do you see this whole thing playing out the the, uh, the social media mainstream media circus in a sense i would say that in the past 30 years we have had enough examples to now reach the conclusion that no form of media can replace another mm -hmm. they can only supplement each other initially when television news became big with the advent of cable tv there was widespread concern in print journalism that newspapers will cease to exist after some years because things that we break, you know, news that we break the next morning, people have already learned about them the previous night. So who is going to read the newspaper the next morning? But that never happened. Newspapers still are thriving and some of them are doing very good business. Similarly, uh, there was another concern during uh, the cable TV era, which was that children who were getting addicted to television yeah. were being told that you should, uh, you know, exercise some restraint. You should not be so glued to the TV all the time because it is finally a one-way communication. Mm -hmm. TV is telling something to you. You cannot tell something back to the TV. So it's one way communication, which is making you dumb. And then we had internet when it became a two way communication. So uh, you are uh, uh, perhaps, let's say you subscribe to uh, uh, a certain uh, news websites, Surf News, uh, Swarajya, Op India. Maybe you also want to look into what the other side is saying. So you would read the wire scroll, etc. Yeah. And then uh, you also tell them what you feel about it. 
in the comment section, let's say on Facebook or on Twitter, you quote a certain tweet and say, well, this is what I feel, or you use the reply button to uh, express your opinion. And somewhere down the line, when uh, their marketing department, you know, collates all the data of engagement of every post, they of course pass it on to the editorial team saying that, well, this is the kind of reaction your news content has elicited over this period of time. So to do better business, why don't you tweak your policy a little or give more stress to certain parts and just play down certain other parts. So to that extent, it will play a supplementary role. Why it can never replace mainstream media is because people other than journalists do not have a primary source of information. Right. You're, so you can only react to what is being told to you. I just wanted to quickly react to what you said because we we, right. we also have uh, journalists today, you know, uh, making news out of studios. I mean, yes, <laughs> you know, yes. Uh, obviously pun intended, but you know, <laughs> so but we do have this uh, case of you know people are almost creating news in a sense. You know. So, but but I do take your point about you know the one uh, the way where you let me about, share an example. And I, I think that not only journalists, but also many average, uh, you know, uh, news consumers must have noticed this. And I'm giving this example from, once again, Hindi language media. There was a point of time when no matter what Ajtak was saying, the background would always be the same. So this India Today group, Ajtak belongs to the India Today group had their offices in uh, Jhandewala, a place in Delhi called Jhandewala, a tall tower in that building. So any reporter had a favorite spot as their backdrop. So they would stand in front of the camera and start saying, going blah, blah. And then it struck a lot of people that no matter what the story is, why is the backdrop always the same? And it, it was quite a vantage point, you know, from that top of that building, you could see the Raisina Road the parliament, etc. So sometimes it would give a, an impression the reporter is actually standing there. But this is a kind of, you know, not ethical, I would say, uh, to mislead uh, the viewers into believing you are somewhere where you actually are not. So that was the first, uh, uh, you know, instance of what you could call armchair journalism, not moving anywhere, staying in your office, making a video and creating an impression that you're working very hard, you're on the field. Yes, but it still happens. Uh, beyond a certain extent, it, it will not succeed. Uh, it can succeed as propaganda. Uh, if I take, for example, the uh, uh, case of 2002 Gujarat riots, uh, when you Google 2002 Gujarat riots, the first thing you get is the Wikipedia article on it. Right. And if you scroll down to the reference section, you would see that in 2002, when the riots were on, there were hardly five journalists who had visited those spots, uh, in interviewed police officers, talked to, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, Justice Liberhan, and uh, other things like that. So, uh, and the rest just made reports based on hearsay or based on quotes from other newspapers and news agencies. So that was a, a very uh, negative and wrong kind of armchair journalism, which we saw in the previous decade. Uh, but yes, now I think uh, certain uh, even startups are realizing that it does not always work. And therefore you would see that a lot of them Mm, uh, take, for instance, uh, Swarajya. When I was working there, I was their only uh, reporter, you know, who, uh, only editor who sufficed as a reporter. But now, if you look at Swarajya, they are doing quite a bit of reporting as well. Uh, and especially during the Delhi riots, uh, there were several uh, reports, uh, as much by Swarajya as by Op India, that were from straight from the field, from where things were happening. Yeah. So that is appreciable. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll make a quick, uh, small segue and then come back to this. You know, one of the things that I know about you is that you have multiple interests. 
and one of them is obviously your your proficiency with the languages many languages i'm not going to mention that but i know that uh, the first time i i realized that you know I've, uh, is that when you i i used a, a, a tamil word for a, an article that i had written and you picked, and, and you you had inserted in brackets the correct translation of that word that's when i checked with you and said you know how did you manage that and you said you know you also you had the contact of the tamil sangam to learn, you know try to learn the tamil as well and all of that so i understand you also you know speak multiple languages you're comfortable so how is this uh, what has shaped that interest in languages and how has it helped you in your uh, profession i mean obviously there, there is is there a connect at all or is it this is something that's separate from all of uh... okay yeah well, first of all it is not necessary for journalism how i shaped up like this was because of my social background uh being a bengali uh, i was not born in bengal hmm. you know i was born in madhya pradesh uh and in jabalpur and uh, then i did my schooling in southern bihar the part that is now jharkhand and uh, right from the beginning i think uh, i grew up as a trilingual person because i would hear all the neighbors speak hindi while i would speak bangla at home and then very early uh, you know even before i went to school my mother introduced english to me and mother is the best first teacher right. you know there cannot be a better first teacher not even the father than the mother so my mother introduced english to me and then uh, uh, i went to a school where uh, the teachers were predominantly from kerala it was a convent school uh, so convent school of course you would uh, it's a very common sight to have a lot of nuns from kerala so initially uh, it was a you know a swiss institution uh, established i think in 1836 but they were uh, in in this country since the colonial times and then uh, i was also quite uh, you know uh, uh, quite a keen observer i would not just say watcher or Uh, a lover observer of films i would not just watch a film for its story or its you know performance by the lead actors etc something in me made me very interested in the linguistic aspect of films so i noticed uh, uh, you know in the black and white era the hindi was actually not hindi it was what is popularly known as urdu yeah correct Uh, yeah and then i would uh, find that uh, some very eminent personalities from the film world for example a music composer noshad he would say certain things like uh, lata mangeshkar cannot uh, you know pronounce urdu words properly things like that uh, and she had to be you know we had to put her through a certain kind of training so that she gets the diction right etc so that intrigued me because i never found anything wrong with lata ji's singing or pronunciation or so and there is something similar you would find in bengali society even for a year if you go out of bengal and come back people will say your bangla is spoiled you are no longer a pure pure thoroughbred bangla so that kind of nitpicking you know where most people wouldn't notice what is wrong with the speech but then so uh, that that made me very uh, interested and then uh, in the senior classes 9 10 11 and 12 though in uh, you know 11th and 12th grades the pressure of mathematics and physics was very high but still we were so passionate about these things we started an experiment uh, in our hindi classes which is not a convention in hindi which is we started using nukta that is dots beneath uh, certain letters to make a difference uh, you know and uh, so uh, like for example i i wouldn't say khas i would say khas you know khairiyat khab khoobsurat you know this 
these things that you pronounce they are typical arabic phones these are so uh, then ghazal ghair so uh, uh, there 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 is uh, gul gul means a rose gul and gul means something has disappeared so uh, <laughs> you know so uh, a very common joke for instance let's say some office colleagues are just chatting somewhere uh somebody is looking for a glue to paste something and uh, somebody remarks gum nahi mil raha uh and the other guy quips uh ke are gum nahi khushi dhoondo gum okay so gum nahi khushi dhoondo and then a third guy who knows urdu points out it is not gum it is gum yeah so these things were very intriguing about urdu as as a very young person and so when i moved to calcutta one day a relative happened to come to my place uh, and noticed that i used to have a scrapbook that i write hindi quite unusually with with nuktas in the appropriate places mm-hmm. and he remarked that since you are doing this even without training why don't you get yourself trained so then of course i got uh, myself enrolled in the ramkrishna mission school of languages in kolkata but while learning very uh, urdu very early i uh, realized that it was not making much sense unless i knew persian and arabic as well because they were the main uh, sources of vocabulary for this language while urdu is an indian language that uh, took shape in northern india as well as hyderabad uh, a different version of urdu took shape in hyderabad popularly known as dakkani yeah dakkani yes so uh, any anyway uh, the source was certainly foreign the vocabulary source was foreign and uh, so i started learning those languages as well uh, by the time i finished them i uh, suddenly uh, the idea crossed my mind that maybe it is not urdu persian or arabic in particular but the very idea of languages is very charming to me that was when i got into french uh, then of course i could not complete uh, german and tamil but i would have loved to uh, there was so much of work pressure i could not complete it now coming to the other part of your question while i said it is not necessary for journalism it helps in uh, you know making comparisons and if you are the senior most person in an organization that comparison is very vital to how your news is presented for example uh, when you move from english to hindi to different indian languages you would see a remarkable change in the way things are reported in uh, these different languages in english ramesh venkataraman went to the market will be said as ramesh venkataraman went to the market that's it that is pure pristine journalism now the sky was cloudy it was raining that is how uh, typically regional language media reports you know the story will start somewhere in the third fourth fifth line and then if you uh, if the editor is very opinionated because ramesh is a good guy or a bad guy he went to the market at this point of time so uh, that is how it goes so when you come from the english language media let's say you are heading uh a media house and you are not doing all the work yourself then of course you can bring together the editors of the english section the hindi section the other language sections which i did uh, as uh, the executive editor of hindustan samacha i would tell hindi language uh, media people that the way you spin a yarn is not how it is supposed to be done you are writing a report and not an article where you can use linguistic flourish and all that in a report you are just you are supposed to just put it, put things straight as they are so that is one uh, uh, for instance you know 
once in a while when i open anand bazar patrika which is in bangla or or uh, you know uh, z bangla 24 ghanta it's another website as well as uh, news channel so i find their news presentation laughable because i have been in english language media for so long where reports are supposed to be extremely strict you know uh, you have a total no nonsense approach to report at the same time there are certain virtues of hindi and other indian language media that english language media does not have for instance uh rural coverage uh agriculture then certain uh you know certain insider information which uh ministers mlas mps etc are very comfortable sharing with uh, the indian language media journalists they are not that comfortable uh, sharing those things with the english language counterparts and uh, that is an advantage for them and disadvantage for the english language media uh, uh, i remember that uh, when i was working with hindustan samachar uh, the owner of that agency was one day telling me he was from the hindi language media that in the middle of an election mark tully came to visit them and uh, this was uh, i think uh, in 1998 when for the first time vajpayee government uh, for a year was formed uh, you know after which it fell by one vote in the parliament and then got reelected etc so uh, <clears throat> it was a press club dominated by hindi language journalists they were quite surprised to see mark tully there so they all asked sir what are you doing here mm, it is not even your language why have you come to speak to us so mark tully said that well you have some information that uh, your english language counterparts don't so i need that information from you and i'll not get it from uh, somebody who works with the times of india or the indian express i'll get it from someone who works with uh, uh, you know dainik vishwamitra or something like that or aryavarth or aaj or something like that. so that that is the advantage that uh, mm, Uh, the uh, indian language media has over the english language thing we are almost out of time i think we have about 2 minutes so and i don't think we even crossed uh, you know half the bridge in the, in the sense uh, conversation uh, any question from the audience yeah i think uh, common friend has asked about uh, how uh, you know hindi words like samosa etc have crept into the english dictionary and, and it's become mainstream you know english language now has started to use this and uh, it's also crept into journalistic uh, reporting as well yes so any thought well in, in journalism one thing we are told again and again that you should make sense to a school dropout as much as you make sense to a phd scholar so of course if i know for example uh, uh, what what is uh, as a photida for example if i write as a fortida 90% of my uh, you know readership will not understand what i am talking about i have to write hing mm. if i write hing even if the word does not belong to english people will understand and my point is not to uh, you know dazzle anyone with my knowledge of vocabulary my idea is to communicate what i am saying must make sense so uh if i say such a such political party has called a strike what kind of strike but if i say it is called a band mm. band is not english but it is a very specific word just any kind of strike is not band so therefore uh, uh you know uh, any uh, borrowed word is always used for the convenience of the news consumer not the convenience of uh, the journalist another question i don't know if you can see it on the chat but i think uh, uh, it says uh, namaste surajit ji news reports these days are called stories is this a mm-hmm. right word to use yeah it was always a story uh, you know uh, from as long back as uh, journalism has been around uh, journalists inside uh, a media house 
would always refer to uh, a report as a story uh, because it is finally a story, even though sometimes the use of this word sounds insensitive. For example, let's say people have died in, in an incident. If you say it's a story, people will say you are inhuman. How can you call such a tragic thing a story? Uh, but then that is how it has always been. Uh, but uh, what has changed of late is that journalists have started using this word publicly. Oh. Yeah. Earlier, we never used to say in front of people who are not journalists, it's a story. It, it was a word for internal consumption. I don't know how it came out. Yeah, now I think it's, it's, it's become fairly common. You know, we see yes. it, even by the TV news. So I, I'll just ask one last question. I think we, we perhaps we may need to do another conversation to go over several things because there's so much to cover. And, you know, we've not even, uh, like I said, crossed half the bridge in terms of what all we wanted to cover. And I, but uh, again, like I said, I, I would ask you a fairly personal question. Uh, I think it's also important. The conversation is also about uh, you know getting to know people better in terms of that. So uh, you know I've seen some of your uh, writing outside of the mainstream media. You're a deeply spiritual, dharmic person who speaks on matters related to dharma as if from a deeply experiential state. Now I can relate to that when you write about it or when you speak about it. For example, I've rarely seen anyone speak or write with the kind of felicity that you do when you talk up when it comes to the Bhagavad Gita, for example, you know, some of the insights that I, that I personally got were from your writings or my interactions with you. And I'm saying this perhaps for the first time, but a lot of the interact, a lot of the insights I got is actually from you. So I just want to know what, 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 what is that from where does that come and what is it and how is that uh, you know, shaped who Surajit das, Dasgupta is as a person? It must have played a role, but uh, uh, I tend to get very emotional when I, uh, so uh, uh, I would say that it came from my family, of course, uh, my father and my grandmother. Uh, I used to be a very naughty boy and particularly very averse to sleeping during the afternoons, which is a favorite pastime of Bengalis. Mm. So yeah. how, how to keep me in the bed, you know, tight to the bed. So my grandmother devised the strategy of narrating the Ramayana to me. Uh, that was one story that she knew very well. And the, later on, I uh, realized when I was in my uh, teens, that the version of the Ramayana that she would uh, actually narrate was Krittibas Ramayana, which is the Bangla uh, uh, Ramayana. Uh, there are certain uh, differences with the Valmiki original. But then that was my initiation to uh, spirituality. And uh, then, of course, uh, you know, if, if uh, Mata Sati can misinterpret uh, Sri Rama lamenting for his wife who has been abducted, then I'm a mere mortal. Somehow, as a child, I felt Sri Rama was not strong enough as a god. Why, why, why you know, for his loss of wife, why he has, he's so broken down so miserably. As a six, seven year old, that is how I looked at it. And I hadn't yet read Ram Charit Manas, which is very popular in North India. In Bengal, it isn't that much so. So, but then by the time I developed the maturity to understand Rama, Krishna had already been introduced to me. So in comparison, I found that this is one entity capable of being called a hero who is never bogged down, no matter how difficult a situation. Yeah. So then how did he come to this, this being what he is? 
and that is what you get from the get from Sri Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavad Gita. So there, Arjuna is full of doubts, and very patiently, God, not Krishna, because throughout the Gita, oh, it is, yeah, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. So it is, it is not Krishna Uvacha, it is always Sri Bhagavan Uvacha. So he teaches us how to arrive at that kind of, uh, you know, dispassionate, uh, your, your duration on this earth has to be of dispassionate karma. You have to do karma, not that you just lay back and say that, well, everything is upon the fate and everything God has already decided as, because there are a lot of misinterpretations and very bad misinterpretations of the Gita also. You would sometimes see this frivolous Bollywood uh, showing villains quoting the Gita. Saying, I'm doing nothing. Justify God their, is making me do everything. Justify their acts. What, all of their, yeah. Yes, they, they of course cannot get away by quoting uh, Quran like this or Bible like this. They take this liberty only with Hinduism. Yeah. But anyway, uh, you know, answering your question. So that comparative, uh, uh, you know, analysis of Rama and Krishna uh, may be... Uh, you know, unquestioned, uh, there, was, there was no question about doubting Krishna. That is how it began. Uh, because uh, he came across as a character who would prevail no matter how difficult, how challenging the situation is. And if you have surrendered to him, he will save you. He will rescue you from the trickiest of situations. That was how... Uh, uh, the initiation began. And then, of course, uh, I revised my position wholly on Sri Rama also. I couldn't have done that as a five or six year old. Uh, so people will forgive me for that. Uh, but then, uh, you know, as I read more and more, and then I started reading about all the incarnations of Vishnu. And there I also found that time and again, he has saved not only us mere mortals, but he has come to the rescue of everybody, even gods. Because uh, 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 quite a few gods uh, had this uh, you know, easy way with the asuras. Whatever boon was sought, they would give. Maybe after thousands of years of penance, that's a different thing. Other than amaratva, other than immortality, you ask something from Brahma or Shiva and he grants you. Yeah. The deadliest of weapons, anything. You ask and he grants and then poor Vishnu has to come and save them finally from this demon. So again and again, I found this, this story repeating. And therefore, uh, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, uh, Krishna or any incarnation of Vishnu uh, came across as uh, an entity I must look up to uh, without questions. Uh, but then also there is another thing I got from the Gita, which you will not get from, if you just extract the literal sense out of it, which is that whoever your deity, deity is, whoever is the dearest to you, you can look at that deity from this perspective. It, it can be Shiva, it can be Durga, Shakti. You know, that particular deity you can put in that position who is asking the whole humanity to believe, walk in the righteous path and be detached with your relations, with your material belongings, etc., do not consider what is already done to be something that you are doing. Do not lament over things you cannot change, things like that. Uh, the, these things you learn also from Shaiva Dharma or Shakta Dharma. Uh, so these, these are the things I, I don't think, uh, you know, made me a journalist, but it made me uh, react very strongly to any kind of falsehood.
in journalism. That is uh, certainly a, a thing. I just cannot stand it. And uh, uh, in any kind of falsehood, either deliberate or made out of ignorance, both are wrong. Because the question of Rama, Krishna, etc., also come up at times inside media offices, inside media houses. I have had junior colleagues tell me Sri Rama was a bad husband. This is utterly frivolous, uh, you know, superficial uh, understanding of things. But then a journalist who believes that Sri Rama was a bad husband is bound to be a bad journalist. Because the way he looks at a divine relationship, the relationship between Rama and Sita, you will have to have a certain kind of sensitivity, uh, not just knowledge, to able to gather in what realm, at what level things were happening in the Ramayana. If you are, have not reached there, it means that even while reporting about a political party, about a government scheme, about a national policy, you will be frivolous. A person who says that Sri Rama is a bad husband, was a bad husband, is basically a superficial person who does not get into the depth of things. That is what tells, uh, that is what that utterance from that person tells you about his character or nature. So to that extent, it is important in generalism. Yes. I, I, I think there is uh, one, one, one participant has uh, typed in saying, is there a chance for one more question? If Surjit has the time, I don't have a problem. Even if it's only going to be the two of us, we can hold a conversation. Sure, uh, go ahead. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, Amarnath, I think you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, hello, Mr. Surajit. Uh, this is Amarnath. I'm calling you from Hyderabad. Um, I've been married to a journalist for a long time. So this is a question uh, which I would like to pose to you. Um, there are stories and then there are so many stories uh, that you cover in a long career. Uh, but I find that journal, uh, given the pressure of uh, the current story, we often lose sight of previous stories. And to, to, to what extent uh, is it the onus is on a journalist, uh, especially the editor of a you know, publication? Um, how, how do you keep tabs on which stories to continue and which to let go? Uh, my question was triggered because recently a lot of my friends, both overseas, who have taken overseas citizenships and local friends were all uh, greeting each other for uh, the Independence Day. And they were saying happy independence and all that, even though they're no longer you know, Indian citizens. And that actually made me go back and put two things together. The Sepoy mutiny of 1857 was triggered when Mangal Pandey and his other Hindu brothers were asked to bite off the cartridge end, which was greased with beef tallow. And that started the Sepoy mutiny, which was put down subsequently, and a lot of people you know, derived strength from it to go on and really work for independence, the country's independence. But several years later, well into our independence, there were a group of businessmen who mixed beef tallow with Vanaspati. And the judgment was finally given after 20 long years and they were imprisoned for just four years, the perpetrators. So, you know, how, do, how, do, how does uh, an average Indian put these things together? We are so against, you know, putting... Even the concept of beef, you know, even if somebody is eating it 10 houses away, we are not happy. And then Mangal Pandey is not happy because he has to bite the cartridge. Then what got into these people to adulterate Vanaspati with beef tallow? Mm -hmm. I can only assume that it must have been cheaper alternative. And, uh, and, and, the, and the citizens of India completely ignore it. I was a kid when this happened. I still remember it. I, I put the two together. Here. May I attempt an answer, please? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Amarnath Hari, uh, there are three or four parts to your question. 
and the first part the first two parts are clearly about journalism from 1857 onwards up to the beef in banaspati mm-hmm. uh, uh, okay. how do you uh, you know relate it to journalism mm-hmm. because uh, i i can but uh, let me first attempt the first two parts <laughs> first about depth and I then about so choice okay. i think there is an audio interference last uh, i'll i'll mute it yeah i'll mute it yeah. okay now uh, let me share with you uh, the other side Uh, what i have experienced in the other side because one thing ramesh ji we did not speak about uh, uh, in uh, you know the part where you int- introduced me was that for a b- very brief period i was also an activist right so yeah, yeah. so yes. while being an activist i was working with uh, mr k n govindacharya and uh, he is a scholar a very uh, you know deep thinker and uh, he has some ideas uh, that have not been implemented uh, in this country so far uh, as far as uh, governance is concerned at the same time he is not uh, believed to be in on very good terms with prime minister narendra modi so now when i was working with mr govindacharya what i noticed was Uh, how the journalists would behave while covering his events so uh, you know we would be there backstage uh, hearing uh, govind ji speak on any issue let's say uh, let's say uh, gaushala or maybe he is speaking about the state of journalism in the country or maybe about the education system in the country and i would see the journalists in that auditorium stand with their tv cameras at one corner least interested in what he was saying not at all interested now when govind ji would descend from the dais they would hurriedly go to him and say sir ek bite de dijiye what bite do you want uh, aaj modi ji ne ye kaha hai to aapki kya raay hai you know how utterly frivolous they are looking for some controversial statement from govind ji they know that he and uh, uh, modi ji do not get along very well and that they will make in a turn into a headline so after the event and all when we would go back to his house or anywhere else where we gathered we would say govind ji we spent so much of time formulating a policy as to how this country's education should be run or how uh, you know we must protect the cow etc etc and you were speaking on those things from the stage and none of these journalists were interested but then i don't blame the journalist i blame the owner of that media house that the person the poor guy has come to uh, uh, you know work for so what happens is if you look at television which is why i keep telling at every available opportunity that real journalism is print journalism television journalism is not cerebral at least there's there's no deep thinking because consider the poor guy he has come under the hot sun you know inside a vehicle that has no air conditioner you have seen what we call ob vans you know those uh, umbrella like thing on the top a dish antenna uh, you know it's very uncomfortable inside that vehicle and Uh, at the most 15 minutes is all that the guy has got he has to rush to another spot after covering you so uh, as a senior journalist when i would appear for interviews seeking a job i would ask the owners of certain media houses why do you push these journalists like this you know this way they are not getting into the depth of any story and whatever uh, you know uh, the the interlocutor or the person that you are going to cover is going to say if you are not even interested why do this uh, you know do this tamasha of of covering everything you cannot cover everything you do not even have the knowledge or intellect to cover everything so just cover the things that you uh, are sure about but then i also saw 
how smarter people handle it. I have seen Arvind Kejriwal how to handle it. What he would do is he would keep the journalists waiting. For hours, the poor people would, you know, wait and wait and wait. In between, some karyakarta of the Ahmadvi party may go up to them and say, Chai wai pienge kya? Like that. And as if, you know, he would play pricey. Arvind Kejriwal would play pricey. As if he does not care. And finally, when everybody is gone, uh, then he would call the journalists. Uh, okay, you are from NDTV, you are from News 18, etc., etc. You are from Aaj Tak. Kya poochhenge? Achha, aap jo poochhenge, uska mein jawaab dunga, wo mein phir clear karunga, uske baad aap studio bhejenge. So that is the extent to which he dictates terms to journalists. He would not only make sure that the questions are to his liking, but even after answering, he would have a say in the editing of that video clip. So that is, uh, and since he was the new kid in, on the block in 2011-12, uh, journalists couldn't do without him. They had to cover him because he was all over the place. He had to be covered. Now coming to, uh, so the answer is, there should be at least one news channel in the country that should decide that we will go into the depth of stories. We will not concentrate on how many stories we can cover in a day. In any case, throughout the day, whatever channel you play, you will see just about five headlines circulating one after another. They don't cover, they don't give importance to more than five stories a day, unlike a newspaper. Now coming to you, uh, uh, you know, the part where you said that Beef was one of the reasons for the 1857 revolt. But then after independence, we uh, got into a place where certain businessmen adulterated Vanaspati ghi with beef. And it took a very long time for uh, the courts to uh, you know, give justice. Here again, I would say that this is one part certainly where uh, television has played a better role since this program is about journalism so i'm turning this answer towards it uh, television has played a better role than print this is one of the few things because i have noticed innumerable programs especially on hindi language channels and regional language channels which have uh, conducted sting operations to so to show food adulteration uh, or, or adulteration in anything that is edible, uh, be it milk or, uh, you know, dalda, vanaspati ghi, uh, then even uh, preservatives used in uh, the kind of food that you can store and sell. So in, in that regard, television has been impactful. And as far as court verdicts are concerned, it is often seen that when television makes a lot of noise, our milords take notice of it. So uh, maybe uh, had it been the height of uh, journalistic activism at that point, uh, we would have got justice for this adulteration against this adulteration much faster. Yeah, any other questions? We'll have to do another uh, conversation with, uh, with you, so I think that's the only way we're gonna be covering all that we want to cover. I might also mention that we, we do plan to do uh, an exclusive uh, conversation, even if nobody attends, uh, it's just the two of us on uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which would be under sure. the under the, love to do that. Uh, under the edges of the Vivekananda Institute of Indian Studies. Where, uh, you know, we take up, uh, I think we also identified a couple of verses that lend itself to, you know, for us to explore them further, which is how it should be done. So it's, it's uh, been an absolute uh, pleasure. I think, uh, is, is there uh, if somebody else wants to, from uh, SBY and really wants to say something and I'm open to that. But I think uh, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you on this conversation. I know, you know, every time we get into a conversation, it probably drags and, uh, you know, goes on without us knowing the time. And if this, if this wasn't uh, going live, I probably would have continued uh, speaking. So I just wanted to thank you from uh, on behalf of SUIM, on behalf of VIS, on behalf of VIS, all of all our uh, 
uh, organizations for coming on coming on this uh, conversation agreeing to do this for us and i think we will continue to bring more conversations and thank you uh, surjit das thank you everyone for coming thank you very much ramesh ji and all the viewers who are either on the panel or watching us otherwise thanks a lot for being so patient i think uh, somashekhar ji is raising a hand or something okay uh, thanks very much thanks a lot for having me on the show and uh, time permitting i would most eagerly uh, look forward to a conversation on shrimad bhagavad gita that would be a pleasure that would also uh, uh, you know be for my own uh, peace and well being as much as uh, uh, of yours or anybody else thanks a lot ramesh ji thank you thank you and uh, like we've done we've we've done four conversations of uh, this season and in episode 5 we will have uh, rama venugopal who is a trained bharatanatyam dancer as well as teacher and she also you know brings she's also a student who has also studied indian history temple architecture and all of that so I, i'm sure that is another conversation which we will be doing under the vivekananda institute of indian studies this time which will also i think explore you know give a open our eyes to a multiple things that we want so that will be conversation for next week till then thank you everyone for coming on board this the uh, like i said we would be sharing the youtube links as well thank you surjit das gupta once again and thank you everyone and have a great weekend thank you